Hello, I am Andrea Stella. I'm the author of The Debugging Book, and I'm here to present you a new chapter. Okay, welcome everybody to another day in automated debugging. I hope you can all hear and see me. So today we are start, well, today we are looking into interactive debuggers and I'm going to have the lecture in about uh, 45 minutes. And before Johannes and Konstantin are going to introduce you to our first project description. And I'm happy to hand over to, well, who wants to go first? Johannes, Konstantin, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I'll go ahead. Um, um, yeah, so hi uh, from my side. Um, as Andreas already said, the, today is gonna be a bit different. Uh, the actual lecture will start a bit later, um, but now we will, uh, yeah, introduce the, the, the project you all have been waiting for um, and explain a bit how you are supposed to do it and what we expect from you. And um, we will also give you a short demo of how this could look like in the end. Um, yeah, so for the first project, as um, already stated on the web page, uh, we will have a time travel debugger, or you will have to implement the time travel debugger. Um, there will be two possibilities to do that, either alone or in a team. Um, it is up to you what you choose. Depending on which mode you go for, you have to do a bit more work or not. Um, and how all of this looks like will be explained by Konstantin now, and he will also give a short demo um, so, yeah, consent if you want, you can take over then. Yeah, thank you, Johannes. Let's move on to the presentation. As Johannes told you, the project, the project's name is Time Travel Debugger. The today's lecture will be about the actual interactive debugger. And I think most of you uh, already got acquainted with the 
some kind of this debugger while you're, you're studying. For instance, almost any IDE offers this possibility, but almost all of these debuggers only uh, offers you a normal execution of a program. When you start a program, then you can put some breakpoints and see and evaluate uh, some variables. But what would be really cool if you can not only go forward in an execution, but also go backward. And that's what we want you to implement. Let me show you a short example. So let me share my screen. Now you can see it. So for instance, we have a remove HTML markup function, which you probably all remember from the previous lecture. And we want to debug it. So here we have a view for the code of this function. And we can click forward and follow the execution of this function. But what we can also do, we can use this timeline slider and go ahead in time with higher speed. Oh, and now we enter the print function implemented in Python. So here we have some long listings with line numbers starting with 1000 something. But at the very end, we are back to our remove HTML markup method. But what we can also do is we can go back in time. either with button clicks or with a timeline. And to the left of this uh, code window, we also have a variable screen, which shows us the current values of all local variables. So the idea of the time travel debugger is to record the whole execution of a program, making a snapshot of each moment, of each frame, and then re-executing program, allowing to go back and forth in time, looking at all the variables available and the uh, current executed line in the code. For sure, it would be great to put some breakpoints here, not only to go to the start of the program or to the end of the program, but implement some further functionality. And here we have a nice description. Well, I hope it's nice, self-explaining, a description of a project. I hope that Johannes, or well, maybe me later, will publish the link. Actually, this is the link to this description. It will be available soon as a news update. So the description has all the details you need to know to implement this project. We have two options here. Either you can go with the first option and implement this project alone, or you can go and team up with the other person. So here we go. Yeah. And implement a GUI based debugger. The difference is the following. The GUI-based debugger has some GUI as the one I showed you a few moments ago. The, it should contain the appropriate GUI, including all the views and controls. 
while the first option project should be a command line based project when you are able to type in some commands like step next so let's go down and look at some comments available for instance if you provide the following input like step 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 then print some value and then continue then the command line based debugger should print out appropriate lines and then print the value of the variable s here we have some example interactions well currently these are just mock-ups since most of the functionality is not implemented and it's up to you to make it work but you can get acquainted with the interactions and understand what we want you to implement and for sure you will get more information during the lecture when the actual debugger will be presented with the code and some working examples but i hope that the description oh by the way yeah this description also has a long list of features to implement starting from very basic features like quitting the debugger because well it's assumed to be an interactive session printing some help information regarding the available comments as well as their description and possible arguments and proper processing of arguments because if you want to set a breakpoint with this some um, code line which is not available or which contains only comments then it should not break the debugger and just print a nice message to the user. Then we proceed with different navigation commands, starting with very simple ones like step and backstep. Well, keep in mind that this should be a time travel debugger, so it should be possible to go not only forwards as with normal debuggers, but also to go back in time, restoring all the values and unexecuting functions, if any. And then continuing with more handy commands like start or finish, which takes you either forward or backward inside a particular function or executing the code until a certain point, either a line with a certain number or a function. Keep in mind that some functions may be imported from different modules. So sometimes it's worth to specify the file name. Then we have the call stack, which is nice to look at sometimes. And for sure, code and variables inspection. So these commands are here to let the user inspect and display the values of all or some of the variables available within a current frame. We also have different watch points. Well, basically this is just a value of a particular variable or it can be also a simple, um, for instance, mathematical statement or a function call. A user wants to output each time the 
uh, value of this variable is changed. It can be handy in some particular situations. And finally, we have breakpoints. Well, for most of the debuggers, breakpoints are a really important part of a debugging process, making able to stop at the particular point in time. Again, here we have a time travel debugger. So sometimes it can be useful to continue the execution backward, but then stop at some particular line. Depending on the command, whether it's continue or, well, what is the name of the opposite of the continue command? Reverse. OK, so if we go in the reverse direction of the code, still it should be possible to stop at the particular breakpoint. We can also disable and re-enable breakpoints if necessary, or even have some conditions so that the breakpoint is activated only when the condition is evaluated to true. The difference between the time travel debugger and the well, standard debugger is that in standard Python debugger, one can immediately evaluate any expression because we are executing the code interactively, line by line. But in the time travel debugger, all the states are already recorded. So it's not possible to change anything without uh, re-executing the program, as well as in order to evaluate some particular expression, one would need to compile this expression and run it, keeping into account all the current local variables available within the frame. So here we have 20 different features, requirements which ends up in 20 points. So you will get one point for each implemented feature. Some features are very, oops. Sorry, that is really unexpected. Some advertisements, I think. Okay, so we have 20 different features so that you can gain 20 points. Some features are really simple to implement like the quit or help commands. Others may contain sub features. So in order to get a point, you will need to implement all of them. And there is also a may have requirements list and here we already have some suggestions. For instance, you can implement a conditional breakpoint with some complex expression or a special type of a breakpoint which is enabled or disabled after some particular event. But again, feel free to propose your own features and depending on the implementation, you can get up to 10, 10 extra points. So you can consider them as a bonus because we have four projects and must have requirements will give you 20 points. So in total, you will get 100 points if you implement everything from the from this section. So which gives you the maximum grade. But again, you can get more points. Here we have some examples, as I already mentioned. So feel free to go through them and ask questions. And let's move on to the other option 
once again, it should be a GUI based debugger. If you want to team with the other person, you can uh, then, then you, you can go and implement the GUI based debugger here. We have a list of requirements for this GUI based debugger. Again, we have 10 features. So in total, you can get 20 points. And you can get 10 extra points if you implement some of the features from the may have section. It would be interesting to see some implementations that are based on the HTML and JavaScript because they can be run in a browser without a Python backend. Also, there is an option to build a custom Jupyter widget. The example, the demo example you see here is based on Jupyter widgets. For instance, this slider, as well as buttons and uh, the output view are basic Jupyter widgets. So it's easy to deal with them, but you may consider to build your own custom widget, which embeds everything in there. And as far as I remember, Jupyter widgets also allow to uh, save the code as an HTML. So finally, at the end, you will get the same HTML and JavaScript based code, which can be run inside the browser without the actual Python execution, which can be really cool. So just imagine you have a program, you apply the time travel debugger and record the whole execution. And then you can open the browser or even you can post the results in your blog so that others can go and debug your code within a browser. And at the very end, we have the example of how the notebook, your notebook can look like. It contains some personal information, well, depending on the project type, we have either one or two names. Also, it has the implementation section, which contains the actual code with comments pointing to the requirements, sure it would be great to have the description of each implemented feature. And at the end, we have the presentation section. Depending on the type of the project, you will either have to show how the particular comments work with the command line interface, command line debugger, or you may need to embed short videos, either GIFs or YouTube videos into the notebook showing us how the particular interaction work, works within your GUI interface. Well, I think that's it and feel free to raise your hand and ask questions so i think that both me and johannes are ready to answer your questions and well i don't know whether we have let me just stop so, um yeah maybe before we answer uh, the questions um Okay, it's um, not there yet. So, uh, first of all, thank you for um, the presentation. 
for showing us the project. Um, I want to add a few comments on what uh, Constantine already said. Uh, said. Uh, the first thing is the explanation is really crucial. So you really have to explain your stuff. You cannot just hand in your implementation, um, but you have to properly explain everything. Otherwise, um, you won't get enough points for the project. Um, and that brings us to, to an important point. So you can get a maximum of 30 points for this project. Um, but to get any points at all, you have to at least score 15 points. Then you get 15 or more points, depending on how many points you score. If you score less than those 15 points, you won't get any points. Uh, the reason for that is pretty simple, because if you score less than 15 points, you probably did not implement a very useful debugger at all. Um, then regarding the, 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 the two person project and this um, is more of an organization uh, statement. Um, if you want to, to build a group with someone else from the lecture, so group of up to two people, um, please do this using the CMS on your personal um, page. Um, there will be an option to either uh, create a group or join a group. And um, please use that option to um, build your groups and to form your groups. Um, this option will be av available from 6 p.m. this afternoon, or this evening, until Friday midnight. So you have to build your group until Friday um, to be able to, to, to do the two-person project. Um, this will also give you the option that you see um, uh, that you see if the other person from your group has headed in something. So it's a new feature from the CMS. Um, we hope it will work out. If there are any problems with that, please let us know as soon as possible. Again, it's not yet available. It will be available from starting um, from 6 p.m. Um, yeah, then um, there was one question regarding uh, the, the option that one person does the second option and that it is possible. Um, but uh, not, maybe not the best idea. As a reason for that is, even if you opt for the second option, the second project, you still have to implement the command line debugger. It's, and you, on top of that, you have to also implement um, uh, GUI. So it's, it is more work. It's the same work plus the GUI on top, um, just to clarify that. Um, yeah. Okay, so that, that was so far what I wanted to add here. Um, I will now post the link to the project description here in the chat um, so that you can all have a look at it right now. We will, however, um, also um, push the news uh, after the lecture in the CMS that again contains that link. Um, but for now, uh, you, can, you can use that, you can have a look at it, and if there are any questions, feel free to ask those questions now. Um, yeah, let me ask the question. So I think that was my bet with math. Yeah, for sure, we have four projects, 20 points. So in total, you can get 80 points. So if you want the maximum grade, you will need to implement some features from the Mayhaps. Again, it, it makes sense because if you want the maximum grade, you should implement something on top of the base requirements. Okay. The deadline is December 18th. 18th, right. It's also in the project description. Um, yeah, but thank you for the question. We, we forgot to, to mention that. Um, and uh, that why 
that is here is, um, I think, a follow-up question to why you have to also do the command line debugger. And that's basically because the command line debugger has some uh, important um, um, functionality. Uh, but to represent all of that functionality uh, using a GUI would be overwhelming. And the GUI would, would render the GUI pretty much yeah, useless um, because it's just too much in there. And therefore, we want you to still implement that and then implement a graphical user interface that is useful and that you can actually properly use. Um, and therefore, we made this distinction. Um, and that is actually another good point. Um, this is really uh, the idea behind the, the graphical user interface is that you actually put some time in uh, to get a good idea uh, of what would be a good thing, and what would be good functionality, and how could you design uh, the graphical user interface in a way that is actually useful. So this, the, 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 the next question, I, I cannot really answer that question, whether there will be a project over the holidays. Um, but so what I can say, maybe Konstantin, you can clarify if I say anything wrong. If well, again, <laughs> I don't think I can add more to your yeah. comment, but. So um, if we publish a project before the holidays start, we will not count the holidays as working time on that project. At least not in full. That means if if we publish the project beforehand, you will get more time uh, because it was over the Christmas holidays. Yeah. So you are not supposed to work during the holidays. Yeah. Uh, what are the other questions? Is there a notion of a call stack in Python? Well, short answer, yes, but you will get more information during the lecture. Uh, what else? Uh, the second question is, do we implement the debugger on the basis of the HTML markup that has been presented to us in the material? Well, I would say yes and no. So you are expected to reuse the material you have from the lecture, uh, including the debugger itself. For instance, you uh, may find useful to take all the commands implemented in there, the infrastructure to uh, implement commands and reuse it in your project. But for some other functionality, you will have to implement your own uh, parts, your own functions. The other um, is, is the design document expected for the implementation? Yeah, so if I get that question correctly, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you, you have to, so you have to hand in a Jupyter notebook, right? And that Jupyter notebook should contain an explanation of what you did, including how you thought of this thing should work and what you're thinking and rational behind basically your design is. I'm not sure whether this answers the question. I'm not sure, Constantine, whether you want to add something to this. Uh, if it doesn't answer the question, feel free to ask it again. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, basically that's the uh, nice feature of uh, any Jupyter notebook because uh, one can mix the code and the comment, the description, producing a really nice, well, documentation and the code in, in one page. Yeah. 
okay, are we allowed to use libraries for the GUI part? Uh, yes, you are, but keep in mind that you have to hand in the Jupyter notebook. So for instance, I'm not sure you will be able to use, let's say TK inter library for Python, which is well known for making uh, GUI uh, programs, GUI packages. So still your GUI should be um, implemented, embedded in the Jupyter notebook. But if you find some third party libraries with the widgets, feel free to use them. Okay. So for now, there are no further questions, but just yeah, feel free to have a look at, it, at, the, at the project. And if any questions come up, feel free to ask them. And again, um, we would prefer if you use the Q and A functionality, because it's easier for us to keep track of the questions. So, so far, I see no more questions. Well, probably people are just skimming through these. Ah, okay. I see yet another question here. Yeah, but this is a question for you, I guess. <laughs> Well, uh, that's a good question. The question is uh, whether using the TK, which would open a second window, would not be preferred, better to implement as a widget in a Jupyter. Uh, well, correct. It would be better to implement things as a widget or as an embedded HTML. So if you happen to look at the debugger chapter of the debugger uh, debugging booth. At the very end, you can find a nice example where a slider is made just using the HTML code. So even no widgets, just the, the code is embedded into the notebook. So you may find this useful. How do you run a command line with, in a Jupyter notebook? Well, uh, any Jupyter notebook has a set of very nice magic commands. Well, I think it would be easier if I will provide you with the link, but each command starts with the uh, uh, person sign and you can make many interesting things like uh, launching a command line, taking the output of the last or uh, a, a predefined cell, installing some packaging, packages and whatnot. And what you might also find helpful um, if you're concerned with how to interact with your debugger from within the notebook, um, there are some examples of how to do that in the notebook we provided. So I just posted the link. To the official documentation.
Okay, meanwhile, let me post the news update. Okay, now it is officially announced. So you can start implementing things. Oh, well, no, you haven't listened to the lecture yet. Okay, wait a bit to get Really nice lecture on the interactive debugger. I think some of you may already have a look at it. Um, there is another question, um, but there are office hours if um, people need any help with the project. Um, so short answer is no. We, we will have time during the lecture to uh, discuss questions. There is also the forum. Um, if you have any questions and if anything comes up that cannot be answered in the forum or during the lecture, you can of course also contact us using email and we'll get back to you then. But like the first um, two um, things you have to do should be go to the forum, ask a question in the forum or ask during the lecture. Um, furthermore, I've um, activated the, the grouping functionality now. So instead of 6 p.m. this afternoon, so you uh, should be able to create or join a team now uh, or starting now. So if anything does not work out, just tell us, but for me, this looks like it's going to work just fine. So again, this is going to be on your personal status page in the CMS. Yeah. Um, So regarding the teams and where you have to look at, you can still, uh, of course, use the forum or whatever means to um, form groups. And this will be available until Friday uh, at midnight. So you have time. I just already uh, made it available so that you can already start forming groups. So the next question, how do you set up the project? What is a virtual env? Well, virtual env is just a tool to create 
isolated Python environments. And the main idea is to fix the particular packages you use in the project because if the version of the python is different if some packages are different it can create problems during the actual execution because if your environment relies on the outdated version of the library and for instance we during the testing phase install the up-to-date libraries the functionality exposed by the library may be different from the previous version. And let me just post yet another link. But actually, you don't need to make anything specific, especially with virtual end. Uh, it's just important to supply your project with the requirements.txt file, which lists all the libraries that were used in, that are used in your project with version names. And uh, you, you can uh, go and check the documentation to, uh, or we can post an answer in, in the forum how to do that. Too. It is just uh, one uh, command line, so nothing special. But uh, since you lock the environment, we are sure that uh, we will get your project as it is. And as a general um, comment on this, it's using uh, virtual environments in Python is always a good idea almost always for different projects using different uh, virtual environments avoids conflicts in the long run between different uh, conflicting versions of different libraries um, and as far as i remember the latest version of python has its own vn module which is just a simplified version of uh, the virtual amp, so feel free to use it as well, but uh, we have no restrictions in that. Um, regarding the submission, um, yes, you're supposed to hand in uh, the project using the CMS. This is not yet possible. Um, we have to wait to op uh, with opening the, the, the submission uh, until the groups are formed, otherwise this will get messy. So you will be able to hand in starting sometime next week uh, after all the groups are formed. But again, yeah, everything in the CMS and you are supposed to hand in uh, your uh, submission as in zip archive. Oh, great. I already see that there are some questions on how to submit the solution. Okay. Uh, in the forum. Okay. Once again, if you have any questions appearing during the week, feel free to post it uh, on the forum, on the discussion board, so that we can or some other students can answer. So as I don't see any more questions, and I see Andreas being back with us, uh, I think we can hand over to Andreas so that we can start the actual lecture. Yeah, so enjoy. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can hear and see me well. Hello, Johannes. Hello, 
Constantine and in today's lecture, yes, lo and behold, in today's lecture, we're going to introduce the very tools that you need for your current project. So today we're going to talk about interactive debuggers, which is actually the standard mode of uh, debugging a program if you don't have a graphical user interface. We're also going to very briefly look into graphical user interfaces just for the fun of it. So um, actually, actually, this is a really, really simple thing conceptually. And, and again, we are lucky to have Python as our programming language because Python is the language probably in which it is the easiest at all to build a debugger. Let me go right into our chapter and I will, <clears throat> and I will very briefly, actually, we don't need much time for that, walk you through that. So let me see what I can do here. Here is my Jupyter lab. Okay, great. You should be able to see my screen at this point. Wonderful. Okay, so here's our chapter for today. This is how debuggers work. I'll make this a bit bigger so that it's easier to read later on. And this builds directly on our tracer infrastructure from, from previous week. And what we're, what we're building in here is a debugger as a subclass of tracer, which actually gets us an interactive debugger. And there is just one very simple thing that this debugger does. And this is illustrated in this very, sh in this very short piece of code, which I'll, be happy to, which I'll be happy to talk about here. What a debugger does, an interactive debugger does is, again, like a tracer, it has a function that is called with each and every line or call of the program. But now, instead of simply printing things out, what the debugger does is it actually goes into an interaction loop with the user. And this is precisely what we're having here. So we're having a command that says input, and this actually calls an input from the command line. And then it executes this command, and then it continues interacting with the user. That is, as long as this internal variable interact is being set. What such a command can also do is it can turn off the interaction and then program execution continues until the, until the next condition for halting is met. What a debugger typically provides is um, so-called breakpoints. A breakpoint, well, is a line in, is a location in the program. And, and when this line is being reached, then, uh, the, then again, we, stop execution of the program and enter the interaction loop such that you can look at variables and everything. But instead of a break point that is a single location in the program, you can also specify a break condition. And then this condition is evaluated and checked every time you reach a new line. This is actually all there is. The secret is in this small little function input. What does input do? Well, that's very simple. If you call input, well, let's make that x equals input. And then you have a prompt. So here we go, something like that. What happens if you execute that? Well, you get the input prompt and then you can enter something. Well, let's enter something, something, no, something, here we go. And now you can check out the value of X. So, and you will find that this is precisely what has been read before. So nothing too magic in here. This is, and the nice thing is this actually also works in uh, the Jupyter Notebook. So you can actually interact with your tool in the Jupyter Notebook. This is what our debugger uses to actually implement a couple of commands. So for instance, we have a step command, which allows you to go to the next line. And we have a continue command, which now goes and, um, which now goes and resumes execution till the very end. And all we need to do is we set up this execute thingy and then we check if this is a command which starts with S, then we do a step and otherwise we do a continue. And what these commands do is if we have a step, then we do, then we set the variable stepping, which means that uh, we continue execution, but uh, at the very next moment, and when the very next line is reached, we actually go back to our debugger prompt. 
and um, the continue command even turns this off and simply resumes execution till the very end. And you can actually try this out yourself. Um, again, we have such a, what we have here is uh, our simple debugger. And again, we use this, um, we use this mechanism here with a with clause in order to keep things simple. This is actually made such that we do not accidentally step into the Jupyter notebook infrastructure. You, not, ex not exactly sure whether you want to see that. So if we go and uh, run everything up to here, then you can execute this. Now this automatically, this automatically does a couple of inputs which we have prepared before, but you can also simply call this up. And now you can interact with the debugger, which is, well, at this point, there's not really much you can do. You can step through the program, step, step, step. That's actually pretty standard. And you can step and step and further step and continue to step and finally, can continue execution and then you exit the function that you have been able that you have currently been looking at in Jupyter or more precisely in Python it is not possible for a debugger to alter the control flow at least there's no way that I know of so you cannot simply come up with a pre major return from that function or otherwise you always have to execute the function call till the very end yeah, and um, this is just two commands, step and continue. This is very simple. And what we're doing in here is we're implementing a bit of an infrastructure, which actually allows you, wow, this is quite some stuff, which is not too interesting, but this actually allows you to come up with a single, with a single framework in which you can then add a new commands simply by entering, simply by defining methods that start with the name of the command and end with underscore command. And simply by adding such a method to the debugger, you will already uh, introduce a command that has the same name as anything that it comes before the underscore. So um, in here, so and this is the, how the chapter now goes on. It introduces a print command, which actually happily prints out an individual, which, which actually prints out an individual variable and uh, come and defines one command after another, just to show how this works. We implement a list command uh, that actually shows in that actually shows uh, the individual um, that actually shows the um, current source lines in the program. I think I need to run this as a in its entirety so that you actually see what's happening in here. So um, here we have um, sorry. Let me just get back to the point where we are. So if you enter list at the debugger prompt, you can actually see the entire function. Again, you continue execution. Then we define breakpoints, which means that we that we end in a particular line. You can also delete breakpoints. And uh, so we end up one, uh, so we define one command after another. And this is already all there is. And if you just want to see how this works, so let's see whether this works. Ah, yeah, this was just with the given command. So let's try this again. We have plenty of commands being predefined in here still. So where are we? Um, let me see. I'm just going to run everything up to here. Okay, here we go. Now we can execute this. Oh, I think our, I think this is a print delete help quit. I think our list of commands that we that, that we want to execute here is a bit garbled. So yeah, because as I'm going to restart the whole thingy. See, even with our best of our debugging capabilities, we're still having a couple, we're still having a couple of synchronization issues in here. Why is it always doing that thing here? Continue, 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 continue. Ah, break, why is it continue? Print continue. Oh, okay. Good, so let me see whether I can actually start a debugger in here. So let's do that and do that again until we actually clear this list of predefined command. Ah, here we are finally, wonderful. So this is how you would normally use the debugger. So these are all the commands that we are, have, have defined at this point. We have break, we have continue, we have delete, help, list, print, quit, and step. List is the easiest one, you just print out the current line. Now we can again step through the program. And if list works well, it should show the actual line. So this little carrot here shows where you are. And now you can go and uh, actually print out individual variables. So 
let's see what is the value of s or what is the value of all variables that we're currently having and now you can uh, continue stepping through the program and uh, there's also help of course and you can also help on individual commands if i recall it right help continue so there's an entire infrastructure here with which you can actually now interact with the debugger and in the end in order to exit this interactive loop you always have to say quit and then execution resumes till the very end there's a couple of extras in the end so you can extend the list such that it actually you can extend the list such that it actually adds extra stuff but this is already all there is and this is the base for your extended debugger in the project with which you can then go and enter more commands. And um, one particular neat thing in here is, um, so here's a couple of ideas in here for more commands. And one particular thing uh, which is special for your project is so-called time travel debugging. And of course you already have asked plenty of questions about that to Johannes and Konstantin, but the idea of a time travel debugger is actually well to record all the, everything that happens during an execution such that you can later, uh, such that you can later execute it. And we even have a very simple, um, very simple example of a recording. And we have a function named slider here, which actually then builds a, a very simple uh, time travel debugger which tracks <laughs> not too much actually it simply tracks a number of variables along the along the way and with this slider you can then look up the, the variables values in the uh, in the lines as they were recorded this of course is well uh, this is the very very basics of a time travel debugger in reality and uh, as, as you already have seen in the demo video from Constantine and Johannes you would like to have uh, the source code being displayed, maybe moving up and down the stack. And this is all the stuff for your project. This is already all there is. So you can make use of this infrastructure for your own project. And this can be lots and lots of fun. And uh, either build a command line debugger, just the command line debugger, this is simple, or actually extend your command line debugger to a into a full-fledged graphical user interface with uh, widgets or HTML, JavaScript, just as you like. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so I don't see any questions. Ah, okay. There is one. But there was. there's also a person raising his or her hand since a few minutes. Okay, so go ahead, Johannes. What 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 question do we have here? Um, should I allow the person to talk? So that as you like. All right. So, Josh, I think you can ask your questions if there was a question. Okay. You have to unmute yourself in order to ask a question. So there's a button in the lower left corner with a microphone on it and you have to briefly click on that one. Or well, maybe maybe in the it, meantime we'll go for the yeah. for the Q&A question then. Um, there is the question is there a template for the project anywhere? Oh, template for the project. Well, that's very simple. You take the debugger class and uh, take the debugger class and start from there. This already gives you an infrastructure for reading in commands and interacting with them. What you will have to do, of course, is since the project is about a time travel debugger, you will have to change the guts of the debugger class or more precisely of your time travel debugger class such that it does not step through an individual program, but first records everything and then steps and breaks and continues through the recorded execution. But all the infrastructure for reading in commands and dispatching this to individual methods, you can make use of that and then you have a help function, everything, um, everything comes for free. Okay. Yeah, and you can also look at the bottom of the description. <laughs> That's true too. Project. At the very bottom of the chapter, in exercise three, there already is a, is a very sketchy time travel debugger 
which builds a very simple interface with uh, JavaScript and HTML. So two options for you. You can either go this way with HTML JavaScript, if you know this, or you can go and use uh, Python widgets uh, to build a user interface. In this case, you will actually need Python to execute things. OK. So I think, so right now there are no more questions. And the person raising his or her hand apparently does not want to talk. <laughs> OK. Then, well, then also on behalf of uh, Johannes and Konstantin, let me wish you let me wish you lots of fun in building your first own very debugger. Ah, uh, final words maybe. In any other language uh, other than Python or well, generally in interpreted languages, building such a command line debugger, time traveling or not time traveling doesn't make such a difference. Building such a command line debugger is enormous amounts of work. So we're talking about months of work, simply because if you have a simply because in languages like C, C++, compiled languages, also in Java, you have to you cannot simply go and access the source code while the program is running, and you cannot simply access all the variables while the program is running because they all have been because the program code has been converted into assembly code, bytecode, whatsoever, and the variables have all been placed at various memory locations along the way. So you have to set up your compiler in the first place such that it stores all these mappings, the so-called debugging information in the executable. And then your debugger will have to read all of these and then execute the binary file. And every time you want to look at a particular variable, uh, it actually has to map the variable name back to the location, has to find out where the value is and has to convert this back into a readable representation. In command line debuggers, you can even evaluate C, uh, um, C expressions on the fly. And this also means that you, have to, that you have to set up an interpreter for all these expressions. You have to be able to call functions from the program. There's lots and lots of work in there. And all of this work is gone once you interact with them, or once you have a nice, uh, a nice interpreted language such as Python, which offers you the ability to directly interact with the program in question. So, um, so when you'll be bragging after having attended this course that, oh yes, and then I took the course from Professor Zeller and we built a couple of, and we built four debuggers along the way for Python, omit the four Python part and people will fall to your knees. If you say four Python, then people in the know will say, ah, yeah, I understand why you were able to actually do all Okay, no more questions, Johannes, Constant, nope. anything? I don't see any more questions. Any more questions? Okay, good. Then let's call it a day and enjoy debugging. Have a great day, everyone, and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Andreas. Ciao. Thank you too, Fox. See you, bye-bye. Thank you.